السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام ورحمه الله السلام عليكم السلام Hey Alex, you can start whenever you wish. Um, okay, just wait one more minute and then I'll I'll, uh, I'll just get going in Jella. Assalamu alaikum Khalil sahab, are you on the call? Yes. Jazakallah. Okay, so uh, in which case um, we can make a start inshallah. So we're recording at the moment just so everyone knows and uh, it will finish at the end of the, the class inshallah. Um, so Khalil sahab, would you be able to start us off with the recitation please? أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين ولا تستب الحسنة ولا سيئة إذ فبالتي إهي أحسن فائز الذي بينك وبينه أداوة مرقع كأنه ولي همي جزاك الله جزاك الله خليل صاحب um, So the translation of the verses are as follows I seek refuge in Allah the Almighty from Satan the accursed, in the name of Allah the gracious, the merciful. And who is better in speech than he who invites men to Allah and does good works and says, I am surely of those who submit. And good and evil are not alike. Repel evil with that which is best. And lo, he between whom and thyself was enmity will become as though he were a warm friend. This is from chapter 41, verses, verses 34 and 35 of the Holy Quran. So um, with that, um, we can make a start. So just a quick introduction. Um, the lesson is part of the Tablik Ashra, which has been going on over the last few days. Um, and the purpose of this lesson is really just to uh, want to encourage people to do Tablik and also develop their confidence in how to do it as well. Um, but uh, Murabi Saab will be in Chala going through all of this in his presentation. So um, I pass it over to Murabi Saab. Jazakallah. Ashadu <laughs> la ilaha illallah wa tahu la shaykhu wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh amma ba'du fa'uzu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim assalamu alaikum wa So. Today, uh, we wish to talk about Tablik in the present times. Gee. I thought Newcastle was joining this as well. So did I. <laughs> um, dude, dude, please phone um, Shiraz and ask where he is. And we should ask all the Armour members where they are. Okay, so I'll, I'll make some calls. Okay. So, um, as I said, we're going to be doing a talk on Tablik in the present times and then, inshallah, uh, open it up for any questions, comments, etc. Um, if anybody's got anything to say. Right, so, we are living in a Christian country. 
But sadly, the people have moved away and are chasing the worldly pursuits instead. Therefore, preaching in this country is very difficult and far different to preaching in a religious country, which likes to talk about religion. Many people have a very poor impression of religion, and that is why they're not wanting to talk about it or practice it. Society has changed dramatically over the last century, especially in the 60s, where many of the old values and higher deals and morals were discarded in favour of a new, free and classless society. The power and hold of the church has declined, and this has led to a more moral, corrupt and spiritual depraved society. Now, although there has been a great decline in the numbers who attend the Christian church, still deep down there is that belief in God. It's just been moved to one side in pursuit of the worldly attractions. The values have changed and unfortunately the church has also changed to try and please the modern day society and for their own particular social and financial welfare. welfare. This has caused resentment to some people towards a church and on the other hand freedom to others who do not feel the need to be religious. Sadly that's resulted in the new generation not really having any association with the church nor any real understanding of its teachings. Therefore, whilst they may be calling themselves Christians, for a lot of people it is just lip service and not in practice. In this country, generally there are things which the people try to avoid to discuss because it causes too many arguments, and that is either religion or politics. Therefore, if you go straight into religion, then it may quickly put a person off, unless of course they're religious then they don't want to talk about religion. Now, whilst people may not be religious, still they are seeking something. They blame religion. They blame religion for many of today's problems, the wars, the sufferings, the crimes, the break up the families, etc. But in fact, the root of all these problems stem from lack of God realization. People become very materialistic, living only for today, running after their pleasures, etc. And it has resulted in no real peace because they constantly want man, uh, more. So man has this very weak concept of God because subconsciously they've made a man into a God. And as man is weak, so therefore they feel that God too is weak. <laughs> they question about God. Why can't he stop the wars, the sufferings, etc.? Therefore, he must be too weak or he is no longer with us. If he is with us, then why doesn't he speak to us? And for further justification, to support their views, they state that surely scientists have proven that there is no God. This has all resulted in a lack of true belief in a living God. Therefore, with the absence of God, Man has turned to other things to try and find peace that he craves for, to alcohol, drugs, pleasures, etc. The material world means that they must have everything now. He will not wait for some supposed hereafter. But without God, then man's instincts of greed, hate and jealousy come to the fore. This is what we need to get through to them, that God does exist. He does talk to men and helps us and that the only true way to inner peace is to develop one's relationship with God. But it is your prayers that will make them want to listen and it is your example that will make them want to be with you. So many times when talking about religion, it may get heated. You may disagree with each other. And if you don't know that person, this might be the last time that you will ever see them. But if you're friends, 
then it's due to the warm friendship that you have, that you keep on meeting each other. Therefore, upon meeting a person for the first time, it's important to try to develop a relationship with them. Talk about many things and listen to them and look for opportunities to see where you can talk about religion. Because at the end of the day, the message of Islam is very strong and it will attract true seekers. But if your example is not correct, then it can easily be put off. Now for me, I use two main methods and I think this is methods which every single one of us can do. It's not difficult. It's actually something which we're meant to do. The first is an example. And so I've often said it and I will say it again. I use the example of Hazrat Abu Bakr. That how? How did he become a Muslim? And when we look at his story, we see that when the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sassam was commissioned to be a prophet, Hazrat Abu Bakr wasn't around at that time. And when he came back, he heard people saying and mocking that the Holy Prophet is claiming to be a prophet. And so it's related that there and then he went to the prophet and asked him, is it true? Do you claim to be a prophet or not? Now, of course, Abu Bakr was a very close friend of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. And the last thing he wanted was to lose his friend. And so he felt it's very important to explain why is he claiming to be a prophet? But when he started to do this, Abu Bakr stopped him and said, no, just tell me yes or no. Do you claim to be a prophet from Allah or not? Again, the Holy Prophet felt the need to try to explain to him, to try to get through to him why he's making this claim. But when he did it again, the, uh, Abu Bakr stopped him and said, is it true? Yes or no? That's all I want to know. Yes or no? Are you claiming to be a prophet of Allah or not? Now the Holy Prophet had no choice but to give him a yes or no answer. So he said, yes, this is my claim. And there and then Abu Bakr accepted him. Why? Abu Bakr knew that this was a person who always told the truth. And this was a person who had an intense love for God. How could he now be possibly lying about the very thing that he loves the most? Therefore, it must be true. So the example was a thing that won Abu Bakr, not the message, just his example. And as I said, this is something which each and every one of us should be setting to people and attracting them through our example. The second method, and again, it's something which each and every one of us should be doing, is prayers. And again, I use the example of Hazrat Umar, Hazrat the second Khalifa. And again, you know the story of how he went to kill the Holy Prophet. He had enough. He personally was going to kill the Holy Prophet and he set off with a sword in his hand. But on the way, a Muslim saw him, saw the anger in his face, the sword in his hand, and asked him where he was going. And so he boldly said, I'm going to kill the Holy Prophet. But that person said, look at your own family first, your own sister and her brother-in-law, they become Muslims. This amazed him, he, he was so surprised. And so he went straight to his sister's house, burst through the door and found that they were listening to the Quran. He went up to punch the brother-in-law, but the sister got in the way. And by accident, he hit his sister. When he saw the blood on his sister's face, he felt some remorse and he wanted to try to please us. So he said, let me listen to the Quran. Now this always gets me that in those times, the women had no say. They were, you know, no one listened to them. No one, they didn't have any control over him. But she stood up and said, no, you are unclean. Go and have a bath, then you can listen to it. And so it's related that um, uh, Hazrat Umar went up, had a bath. And of course, by that time now, he was completely cooled down. And so when he went down and listened to the Quran, then he accepted the message. And at that point, the person who had been teaching him came out of hiding and said that only a day before, the Holy Prophet was praying for either Umar or Abu Jal to uh, become Muslims. So it was the prayers of the Holy Prophet. As I said, this is something which each and every one of us can do. This is not a hard thing to set a good example to pray, but these are the best ways of doing tabliq. Now, when we look at the best example of doing uh, preaching to the English people, then I believe the example was that of the late Dr. Hamid Khan and his wife of Hartlepool Jamaat. 
Not many of you may have known him, uh, but those that do uh, would have been touched by, again, his example and, of course, his prayers. The fact was that he created an English Jamaat. He was the first one to do this. And within a period of five years, he was able to convert over 30 English people. And the secret of their success, as I said, was only because of the power of the prayer and their example. He was a very kind, generous and humble person. And whilst no doubt, of course, he had a good knowledge of the Holy Quran and the Holy Bible, it was his love and kindness that won the people's hearts and minds because they always cared for their converts. And they treated them as if it was their own family and they created a very good atmosphere, which I always used to bring people to Hartlepool just to feel the atmosphere that was being created. And I remember one of the converts that I brought termed it as the Amity Glow. So they would try and have as many one-to-one -one meetings as possible and encourage those people to also bring their friends. And so it creates even more people coming. And they always ensure that whenever there was in the presence of converts or potential converts, all the conversations were in English. It was a wonderful time and those that were there, I'm sure they really appreciated it. Now, all oh right, there's another picture there. <laughs> now, um, let me move on, there we are. When I talk to people, I want to look at how best to convey the message to them. And so what I normally do is try to bring up things which they can identify with, and then try and bring the conversation onto the problems of the society today. For instance, I might ask them that are they happy with the direction that the modern society is moving in? I can then move them on to whether they feel that the TV is influencing them too much or whether the family as a unit is breaking up, etc. And then after hearing their views, now, of course, I can talk about my views, the Islamic views. And then I can explain to them that how we are concerned about morality, the bad influence of TV, how we still give respect to the parents in the Muslims' homes, that even the grandfather will be listened to and obeyed. And so now I'm in a position where I can look for solutions and seek answers to these problems and can bring the subject directly onto religion. So through such conversations, you are helping them to understand what religion really is. That it's not about fighting or terrorism, etc., but it's a way to develop your morality and your relationship with God. Because I believe deep down, everyone has that latent and indistinctive belief in an all-powerful being and they are concerned with the direction the society is moving towards. I know that was the case for me and learning about Islam awoken those feelings in me and so therefore they're happy to talk about such things. Now when you have asked them to give their views then naturally of course they will be willing to listen to your views and hopefully you can then keep them engaged about religion but it's very important that you watch them and see whether they're getting bored and switching off. And if they are, then quickly change the subject. You can always come back to it later or at another time. So it is a very slow process in the beginning. And you may have to leave and meet again and try again. But once you've got them interested, then of course you can move much more quicker and move into more direct religious questions until finally you're talking directly about religion, about the Poor Messiah and about Islam. Additionally, they will understand that you are a religious person and hopefully you've started a good friendship with them. Now for me, I will try to get them to take the free Islamic course that I run. And I'll ask them that question, that would you like to know about Islam? Again, this is a question that each and every one of you can ask. And if they are direct them either to the course or even do the course yourself. It's online. You just go to this website. You can go through it with them. They can send the answers to me and I can uh, send them certificates or print it out. Or you can do that yourself. It's up to you. But at the end of the day, this is an online course, so it is available for everyone. But of course, the real way is one-to-one -one classes. And this is what I'm saying, that this course has 12 papers, which means 12 sessions, 
12 times at least you're meeting them and all the material is there for you you don't have to think about what to talk about it's all there all you have to do is explain more about those uh material where the subject is so of course it depends on the person and why is he listening to you but if he is a genuine person and he's not been influenced by other muslims then alhamdulillah sometimes it does lead to the bat so as i said this is something that you can do you can bring them to me in the mosque or you can obviously get them to do it online and so on and so forth but it's a very good way to teach them about islam Again, for yourself, I have another website, um, which is called ymd.org. And this is very good for material resources. It, it gives you all the quotes that you're gonna need, even how to explain the subject matter. So for a dialer, it's a very good way to help you to do the tablik, or just, as I said, just ask them to look at it themselves if, if you don't want to use it. Now, I've been talking about how to bring a person who's not really religious to religion. But of course, there are many people who are religious. And we don't have to then explain about religion because being religious, they're already following it. But normally, the problem with Christians is because of the high position that they give to Jesus, then even if they are said that the Holy Prophet Muhammad was true, they will still think that he is subordinate to Jesus. Therefore, I will usually discuss about Jesus supposedly dying on the cross. And this, I think, is the main topic to tackle. Because when you do this, then all of Christian beliefs are based on Jesus dying for the sins of man. So things like salvation, atonement, etc., are all because of this. And when you explain our understanding of it, it becomes a real eye opener. And they will accept it and they will have many questions about different doubts on their mind because it makes logical sense and so therefore they can understand and readily agree with it but of course for some people they will hold firm on their beliefs no matter what you say now unfortunately for a christian preacher it's very similar to a muslim preacher and they tend not to answer the questions instead they will try to move you off the subject, maybe posing other questions, especially about uh, attacking the Holy Prophet and stuff like that. But you have to remain firm and not allow yourself to be distracted. So yes, you may go off the subject, but keep bringing them back uh, to the point that you're trying to make and get that point finished as best as possible. So if, for instance, you're talking about the crucifixion, then keep informing that you want to finish this discussion first before talking about Jesus as the savior, or as I said, they may be attacking the Holy Prophet or the teachings of Islam, etc. But if you have to go off, then bring them back to that subject as soon as possible. Now, another subject is the Godhead of Jesus. Now, this of course was one surprising belief that I heard when I came to this community, because personally, I never believed that Jesus was a God. I understood that the Catholics, they believe in the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. But I was a president, and I believed that Jesus was only the Son of God. Now, when I was confronted by this, by our community, and thought about it, then I could understand the logic that they were presenting, that the term Son of God did actually imply that he was a God. But generally, this is something which is not stressed on in the church. And so most people don't really recognize him as a God. But as I said, the more you start thinking about it, then actually you think about what the Christians do, and they do pray more to Jesus than God. And they seek forgiveness from Jesus rather than from God. So therefore, they have actually made Jesus more than a man into some sort of demigod. But like I say, you need to explain this to the people, because if you just straight away say that you say Jesus is a God, most people will deny it and say, no, we are saying this. This is not what I believe. So you've got to help them to understand that why you feel that they've taken Jesus as a God, stressing on who are they praying to and who are they seeking forgiveness from. And only then when they, they, they start understanding what you're trying to get to. Now, of course, another issue is about St. Paul and his influence on Christianity. 
that became his teachings and he has just uh, used Jesus as a figurehead. This again may need a lot of explaining, but they need to know who is the true Jesus. Because this is the problem. Whilst they believe that Jesus has come to save their sins and that all they need to do is believe in Jesus and they'll be saved, then they're not going to really be listening to what you have to say. But when doing to break, it is very important to understand that if you destroy someone's faith, then you've got to ensure that you give them something else to believe in. Otherwise, you may make them into an atheist. This is why I try to tend to explain the differences between what Paul taught and the church and what Jesus taught to help them to understand this point. And I also try to say to them that, look, uh, that I'm a better follower now of the true Jesus uh, teachings of Jesus than I ever could be when I was following it by the church. And so, again, making sure that they understand that you are glorifying Jesus. You're trying to show the true position of Jesus and not the fake position that is being presented by the church. So if you can do this and help them to understand that Jesus was just a faithful prophet of Allah, then they may be ready to worship Allah and follow the, uh, his true religion. And then, of course, you can start talking about the promised Messiah coming as a reformer of Islam, just as Jesus came as a reformer of the Jews. Just trying to catch up with the slideshow. Okay, so the best form of Tablik, of course, is always one-to-one -one meetings. But these days, of course, that becomes very, very difficult. So therefore, we have to look at other ways. Now, Alhamdulillah, our beloved Azur has been stressing on the importance of social media and awareness. And so therefore, uh, this is one of the ways in which we can get people to know and understand about the Jamaat, about its message and the dangers which we're heading for. So Alhamdulillah, we've made great inroads and many people are becoming more aware of the Jamaat and supporting us. Now here on the screen is online virtual meetings. And this is something which is happening. Uh, the UK is doing programs like we see with the Sirtan Nabi uh, in Wolverhampton. They're having separate programs. It's one way, instead of having our function in the mosque, you can have a virtual uh, online meeting. The other way, of course, is through our charity work. And as I said, this creates that good impression. And we've seen how this works, that people are responding to this. So Alhamdulillah, um, where it is the street clean, uh, the new year that we do. Um, and this is a way where you can send messages through Facebook, Twitter and things like this. And people picking up and praising the community. Or as we're doing at present time, this uh, uh, homeless cooking. And again, of course, that has a lot of people's noticed that. Daily Mail did a wonderful article uh, on radio as well and things like this. So it's a way of getting our message over to the people and changing people's ideas about Muslims. Otherwise, you can use Twitter, Facebook, etc. Uh, and again, there are campaigns like this. Um, as this uh, hashtag Khalifa of Messiah and things like this of trying to spread the message as pos much as possible. So these are ways in using online that we can uh, try to get the message across. Now, of course, that can generate contacts. And again, if we see people showing interest, it's very important that we follow that up. Otherwise, it creates an image, but they go cold. And so therefore, it's very important that we try to contact them, we try to develop a friendship with them. And integrate is something where I keep stressing on. It's very important that we not only expect them to attend our meetings, but attend their meetings. Even if it's an online meeting, it has an impression. We've had even in our mosque, people standing up saying, you don't come to our mosque. And alhamdulillah, people in the audience stood up and said, no, 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 this is not true. They have been coming to our functions. So it does have a, a very 
important effect and it's important that not only should we ask them to come to our meetings but we should also be attending their meetings so whether it is online meetings or whatever still you can still attend their meetings uh, and then of course you can invite them to our meetings so the most important thing as i said is prayers and you should keep praying for them and praying for opportunities to uh, for Allah to create for you so that you can meet more and more people and then like i say through your example i always feel this is the best way to develop the friendships and so convey the message so these as i said are two simple ways which everyone can do but these days even though we can't go out and meet people there are ways that we can achieve this through the uh, internet okay so that's uh, the talk that i wanted to give today and now i'm going to open it up for anybody who has anything they want to say uh, questions they want to ask or anything the ball's now in your court uh, we've got about 10 minutes left so um, please do try to ask questions you can uh, send messages through the talk uh, through the chat if you don't want to speak um, but i believe you can just uh, open up your microphone and ask a question if you want so the ball now is in your court so please uh, let's hear your questions or comments or whatever Unless you're all satisfied and you don't want to ask anything. Asalaamu Alaikum. Welcome, Asalaam. First of all, I would like you to send me that photograph. I've never seen that one before. Which one? The, um, all of the people outside of Dr. Khan's house. You've never seen that? Never. Um, right. Uh, I'm trying to think where I got that from. Okay, inshallah. Um, that was just a quick snap, but I can uh, scan it for you. No problem, inshallah. Yes, please. Now, Everyone keeps mentioning Dr. Khan and last um, Friday or Saturday, I can't remember now, the National Tablik Secretary mentioned not only Dr. Khan, but Dr. Khan was an excellent Dalala, but they keep forgetting his wife who was even better. Mm -hmm. And she used to call lots of ladies to uh, coffee mornings and things like that. This is how they started the Tablik. They didn't ram uh, religion down to people's throat. They invited them first for the effort, you know, for me meals or coffee or things like that. And in those days, Asian food was quite a, a unique thing to have because it wasn't many restaurants which sold Asian food. So people became attracted to Asian food. Not only that, Dr. Khan used to, you know, sort of research people's backgrounds before he, he invited them to the house. He invited me, I was a policeman, but I used to work with him for six, seven years before he even invited me to his house. So he used to find common interests between them and talk about that. He didn't sort of start on religion straight away. And in those days, there was very little um, English publications regarding Ahmadiyyat or, for that matter of fact, Islam. But today we have such a plethora of really excellent um, websites. For instance, Review of Religions Online, they do short articles relating to current topics which will really excite the younger people. Rational Religion, that's another one. It's so uh, very interesting. And as you say, practice what you preach. We've had a lot of very good um, press and media attention because of our subscription to the food bank in St. Aidan's Church. And again, Humanity First, two weeks ago, they had a, a telethon. And in this country, they raised over a hundred thousand pounds. And when I do school um, presentations, the thing that most attracts people and are amazed is the actual Humanity First work we do for serving mankind. This is how you start on the bleak anyway, because in this day and age, there's so many worldly attractions for younger people dancing, alcohol, fashion, gambling, housing, TV, music, all these things. And you've got to try to wean them off and that's a very hard thing to do. It's a very hard thing to, to wean someone off alcohol, for instance, or smoking. So you've got all those things to consider trying to get their attention. 
So first of all, you should find common interests, uh, find their particular interests, then gradually bring in religion. The vast majority of people in this country claim to be Christian. But you find anyone who can tell you about their religion and you'll find there's very few people. In fact, as they say, as far as the schools are concerned, over 18,000 school children have been to the mosque. But when I ask who brought the Ten Commandments, very few children, and especially teachers, know who brought the Ten Commandments. No use relying on gradually. Perhaps not about Christianity, but about your own religion, about Islam. So you've got to use your intelligence, use your um, wisdom, and uh, research the person you're preaching to first. Know the likes and the dislikes and the degree of intelligence, the degree of um, knowledge. And this is how you should go for one-to-one -one teaching anyway, one-to-one -one, uh, to belief. That's only my opinion. I'm sure people have different opinions. Uh, Jazakallah. And of course, uh, this is one of the fruits of Dr. Khan and Mrs. Khan, um, Bilal, his wife. Um, but as I said, this is the way he did it. He didn't hit you straight away with religion, like Bilal has said. Instead, he would build up the friendship. And a lot of the people, I mean, especially in the early days, as Bilal said, said Dr. Hamid Khan didn't really get involved. It was his wife, first of all, and the men would just be sitting there. And he, he slowly, like I say, although he had intense knowledge, but he was a shy person, like many people. And it's difficult sometimes to just talk about religion. So build it up. You don't have to, like say, talk about religion in the beginning. Talk about the things which affect them, the society, the things which matters to them. And this, as Blow has said, is what they respond to. When they hear how our work, what we do, that has a great effect. People are very interested to learn that Muslims are doing this because this is not what they think that Islam is doing. So, uh, alhamdulillah, um, as I said, we used the example of Dr. Mead Khan, but the reason for that is he was so successful. And he created an English Jamaat. And in those days, as that picture which Bilal mentioned, if you look at it, it was mainly an English Jamaat. There was hardly anybody who was not English in Hartlepool. And that in itself drew other people closer and closer. So it shows that here in North, in Hartlepool, people do show interest. They can become Muslims, but effort is needed on our side. Right, so Jazakallah for Bilal for that. Uh, anybody else got any comments or anything they would like to say? Any questions they would like to ask? Assalamualaikum, Sabi Saab. Uh, there's been a question on the, the chat, uh, which is why there is so much suffering if God loves everyone? Mm. Yes, I mean, this is obviously one of the objections that uh, people raise. And again, it's through our blinkered view because people think that this world is the most important thing. But to understand this, really you've got to look at it from God's view. And God has created us and this world, this physical world, as a beginning, as a start of a long, long journey. And so, of course, believers, we believe in the hereafter. But when you compare this life, let's say 100 years, to forever, it is hardly anything. So this life is not that important. Now, what God wants to see is how you react. And when we are suffering, there are two ways you can react. Either you turn to God and ask God to help and support you, or you blame God and curse God. And that's what people unfortunately do. And so I often use the example of Africa and say, look, here is a, a nation where they are suffering through wars, through famines, through all sorts of diseases. And there's us in the UK who have everything we have and all these sorts of things. So who is better off? And of course, people will say, well, people in this country. But when you look at Africa, the people there are turning to God because they're suffering so much. Whereas when you look at this country, we're so arrogant. We say we don't need God. We can do everything without God. So when you look at it through God's eyes, which then is better? One 
who is turning to them or one who is arrogant and proud and moving away from them? So why should not God stop this suffering when it's a means to see people, to help them to strengthen their faith? So yes, actually Allah does prevent a lot of suffering. If Allah didn't, there'd be a lot more in the world. So Allah does prevent some, but otherwise he allows some, some natural disasters. Sometimes it's man causing it through wars and things like this. And it's important that we do face these sufferings because only when you appreciate, uh, do that, you can appreciate what you have. And without that, if you're living in such a place where so much materialistic uh, things are around you, you tend to forget about God. Now, at the present time with this coronavirus, it's made the whole world suffer. And if they think about it, why is the coronavirus? You can't even see it. It's such a small thing. And yet it's brought the whole world to its knees. Big leaders like Trump is getting it. Boris has got it or had it. So this is a time when people should be thinking and turning to God that it's only God who can protect them. Otherwise, how are they going to be protected from this? If, if Trump and Boris Johnson can't stop getting the virus, I don't know whether Trump has got the virus or it's just a political thing, but anyway, he's claiming he's got the virus. So if they can't stop it, then how can anybody else stop it? And yet when you look, alhamdulillah, for the Jamaat, mashallah, many of us, because we're turning to God, putting our trust in God, alhamdulillah, we're following the rules, we're keeping away from it, and it's had a very small effect on the Jamaat. Well, oh, some people have got it, but not many. So this is what people should realize, that God can stop the suffering, but suffering is a way for you to understand the importance of turning to God and putting your full trust in God. Why would God take that away? So suffering is part of life. It's important, and that's why God allows it to continue. But as I said, he does protect a lot of the things. Otherwise, we'll be having tsunamis here in the UK if God didn't want to stop that from happening. But it's only God who can stop it. Okay, um, we've run out of time, unfortunately. Um, so if anybody's got other questions, then uh, please, by all means, you can submit them to Alex or Wadud uh, or myself, and we'll try to answer them. Um, Alhamdulillah, it's been a very good attendance. I have no idea what happened to Newcastle. But that's the loss. Um, I'm hoping that I would like to continue this uh, every Friday at seven o'clock. Um, so uh, if people are happy with that, please join us. If you're not, if you think it's a bad time, please let us know. But we will speak to uh, Waduta, the Tablik Secretary and Blausab. And if they're happy, then inshallah, we'll try and have this uh, every Friday, inshallah. So please join me now in silent prayers. Bismillah. Come sir, I mean. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Why, Kishore? Why,